You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And then she said to me, uh, did you hear that? I was like, no, I didn't, can't hear anything, only you. She said, there was a big loud bang. I said, no, didn't hear anything. She said, oh, I'm just going to go and check what it was. And then next thing I know, you know, she, she, she screamed there was someone in the house. And what's going through your mind at that time? Um, you know, instantly, I, I think I screamed, you know, and I, I leapt out of bed because um, I heard I heard Nikki actually say, you know, um, what, what do you want? Get out of my house. So I knew someone was in there. It wasn't like there's someone trying to get in there. It's every husband's worst nightmare, every father's worst nightmare. That to think that your kids are in danger, your wife's in danger, there's nothing you can do. I phone down to her and I kept the line open to Nick and I was just talking to her down the phone. I was just saying, you know, stay with me, you know, I know you can hear me. Just please, just don't, don't, don't go, don't leave me. You know, there were so many thoughts going through my mind at that time. You know, I think deep down, I knew something really awful had happened because of the nature of the screams that were on the phone. I kind of assumed that Nikki was probably dead and I thought the kids were probably next um, and I just lost control. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Daniel Cross. How are you, brother? I'm good. Good to be here. Great to have you on, bro. Um, mad story. Seen your story uh, three years ago. It was yeah. all over the news, all over the new, um, newspapers. You were on the media. You were doing the SES Who Dares Wins. Yeah. Very brave, I know, to do that show. But 2015, you'd lost your wife to murder. Yeah. Well, she on the phone to you. The burglar broke in, killed her, and you heard it all that. Yeah. I watched you three years ago and your strength brother like your strength like your calmness your energy your aura that like, i was like wow blown away this was before i started my podcast or maybe when i just started yeah. i always knew you were born here one day which is mad but when i kind of lost family members and friends to murder and mad stuff i had behind my pain by drink yeah. drugs violence anger frustration when i seen you i done how can this man be so calm yeah i couldn't understand that but for being here today and showing your courage and the things that you do, we'll touch on obviously later in the interview. But first and foremost, how are you? I'm good. Yeah, I'm in a really good place. It's uh, six years since we lost Nick. It was six years on the 14th of September. So it's been a difficult date, just gone. Um, it always is a difficult date. It was this difficult build up to that date. But in general, you know, life's very, very good. I'm very busy with work, very busy with strong men. Uh, just had a new baby. Congratulations. Which was uh, never on the plan. <laughs> but, you know, none of this was on the plan. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's part of life, isn't it? You, your plans change all the time and you've got you've got to move with it. Yeah, before we get into it, oh, brother, I always go back to the start of my guests, get a better understanding about you and where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah. Well, I grew up in Hemel Hempstead. Um, born and raised there. Um I know some people talk about, oh, I was brought up on a council estate and they plead poverty and all mm -hmm. that, but I was brought up on a council estate and it was fucking brilliant. Loved it. Loads of kids about everywhere, you know. Um, part of the, I guess we are a town that was part of the post-war boom, the baby boom and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, yeah, it was an amazing time. I, I grew up in Hemel. I had a pretty unremarkable life, I would, I would say, uh, up until 2015. I, I went to school, did all right. Uh, Bit of trouble here and there with, you know, fighting and that kind of stuff. But who doesn't when they're growing up, you know? There was nothing really major in my life. It was just a normal life. So, you know, what, when what happened happened, it was just something that I never thought could happen. So I was completely unprepared for it like anybody would be. But, yeah, went to school, did A-levels, got a normal job. And as I say, it was a, a fairly normal life. Yeah, so no trauma or pain before 2015. Mum and dad raised you right. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, Mum and dad stayed together all the time, still together now. Um, as I say, I had a really good upbringing. Uh, I had a, a, a family holiday every year, got an older sister, younger brother. And we didn't experience anything in our lives that was, was painful. We were really, really lucky. Um, and yeah, so to say I had the perfect upbringing, I would say, yeah, I did. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, lucky you. Like, Very lucky. It's, um, that's a great thing to see, and you tend to see a lot of people on this show come from broken homes, this and yeah. that, but 
doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad person or a good person. Like everybody's raised differently. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. parents are raised differently. They've yeah. been raised differently. Like that's just life. Like, how was your your jobs and stuff growing up after school? I never really knew what I wanted to do. I, I sort of undenied with the military. Um, I, I considered the navy. I considered the marines. But after after A levels, I was sick of school. I didn't want to go to university. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I ended up just going f- through a few different jobs, warehouse work. Then I worked in a call center for a while. And then I got into a sales job. <laughs> and then from sales, I went into IT and that's where I am today. IT? Yeah, I'm yeah. an operations manager for a, uh, like a, an outsourcing company. How's that? Soulless. How's that? <laughs> Who How's pays that? the bills? Yeah, I just hope the manager's not watching this. <laughs> How's, when did Nicola come into your life? Uh, she came into my life um, in 2004. I mean, I knew her before that, but just as kind of friends. Mm-hmm. We weren't, you know, we were in the same friendship group, but we, we never really knew each other very well. Uh, and then we, we sort of uh, got talking in a nightclub in 2004. Uh, for the first time properly and sort of hit it off really and started talking from there and then we went out on a couple of dates and then we were inseparable from there. It was, uh, yeah, and then we were together for 11 years. And two kids? Two kids. We uh, we were going to get married um, in 2008, 2009. We were planning it, but of course the credit crunch hit and uh, we thought, well, we just can't really afford it. Let's let's have a kid instead. And then obviously, kids turn out to be much more expensive yeah. than fucking weddings. <laughs> <laughs> Got that ass about yeah, face as well. Yeah, bro, yeah, it's <laughs> fucking hell, man. Yeah, yeah. So uh, life is going great. And there's no speed bumps. There's no because were you already a camp person, quite chilled, like no. Where do you not? No, no. I was uh, I was a stress head, um, bit of a temper. Um, and I would always stress about money, about you know life, what, what, where I'm going with my job. Job stressed me out a lot, but I loved it. I loved the IT job then, and I was a career man. You know, I was I was in the office at seven. I was leaving, wasn't getting home again till half past seven, eight o'clock at night. Um, you know, doing those long hours, putting putting the effort in, um, but it was stressful. Um, so I wasn't a calm person. Um, the only bumps in the road we really had uh, was Nikki's health. She was unwell for a couple of years um, after we got married in 2013 with severe asthma. So she was in and out of hospital with chest infections and this kind of pneumonia and that kind of thing. But um, other than that, again, um, a steady marriage, nice marriage, great with the young kids. It was a it was a lovely life. And again, as I say, couldn't really ask for anything anything better. It was just a, a really lovely life. Yeah. So does that put extra pressure on you, like when your missus is really feeling well or not well and you're working more? Yeah, it does. Is that you the know. money problems come in, the stress, is anxiety? That's what causes all that. It's just it anxiety does. Is, is try to provide for your family, be a man, and that's a difficult thing. Like. Absolutely. You know, um, I, I was very much sort of a, a victim to that. I need to keep up. I need to keep up with, you know, what's the next thing, what's the next thing. I want to be another level up in my career. I want the next level of money. I want I, I want to keep chasing it. I was always like that. And when I couldn't get it, I was impatient and that would lead to stress as well. Um, and then, you, as you say, you know, I, I really wanted Nikki to be able to stay at home with the kids as much as she wanted to, you know. We live in a world now where everyone really should get to choose what they want to do with their lives. And, and Nikki wanted to be a stay-at-home mum. She wanted to do that and she wanted to bring the kids up until they went to school. And then she would go back to her career again. So we were on plan for that. We were on par. Um, Stanley was going to start, had already started school. He was, he was six and um, Isabella was, was moving towards uh, nursery and school. So yeah, it was, it was going really mm-hmm. well. And as I say, I would say we had the normal stresses of family life. Again, we were very lucky not to have anyone severely ill in the family, that kind of stuff. My dad had cancer, but we dealt with that. Um, and uh, yeah, just kept moving forward. Yeah, that's all you can do in life yeah. when the obstacles are there. Like, it's such a... It's a mad experience, this journey. Like, I've interviewed so many different people and all the stories are, are different, but in the same way, they're all connected as well. For people who's been victims mm. and for people who's caused harm on others, like, I've sat with both sides of the coin, the people who hurt people and the people who've been hurt. Like, but when you break it all down, everyone ends up hurt. Yeah. Because <clears throat> as human beings, we shouldn't be seeing dark stuff, we shouldn't be hearing dark stuff. People... And the army struggling with PTSD. Yeah. Human beings should not be seeing that stuff, I believe, anyway. And it's just in life, what I've realized in the people I interviewed is that bad shit happens. <laughs> how do we deal with that? Yeah. And how you dealt with it is, which we'll touch on, but I don't know how the fuck you got through that. Like, on the lead up to 2015, 
when you were at work and stuff, were you away working? <clears throat> What was it? What, Not what? a lot, no. So um, there was a restructure mm -hmm. at work and some new directors came in with new ideas and like they always do. Um, and one particular director, he was quite pushy um, and he wanted um, wanted us to go up to Hull where the head office was at a company called Kingston Communications. And um, I was pushing back on it a little bit. It wasn't really my kind of thing to go and stay away from, from work or from, from home, should I say. But he was quite pushy. So I thought, you know what? shut him up I'll, I'll, I'll agree to go up there for these couple of days but it was just the normal work up to that up to that weekend up to that week so on the day of was it night time or daytime uh so on the daytime 14th of september mm -hmm. the, the day before we had been to a music festival in london just me and nick uh, with some friends and just had a great time and then on the 14th i set off for work uh about four in the morning to get up to hull for the sort of start of the business day so um, all the way through that day, I was in communication with Nick because the kids were off school cause, or, and the nursery because they weren't well. Uh, and she was still nursing a little bit of a hangover. Um, but um, they were fine, you know, normal, normal day other than all staying at home together on a Monday. Yeah, so yeah. the kid who did this was 27, Polish guy. Is that correct? He was 23. 23, so a lot younger. Yeah. And there was no signs, nobody ever knew him or ever came across him or... No, he was uh, he was a bit of a mystery, and and you know the investigation afterwards kind of proved that he he'd come over to the UK in two thousand and fourteen. Um, no previous um, mental health issues, as far as anyone knew. Uh, had a job in a warehouse locally and lived in a shared accommodation uh, house, um, but as, as far as anyone knew, you know he was just very very quiet. Yeah. So when you got the phone call, Nick phoned you to say that somebody had broken into the house. Yeah, so it'd been a long day. Um, I'd been working with this director for, till about seven o'clock in the evening. And as I got back to the hotel with a group of the group of the guys I was working with, they were all like, right, let's go out for a few beers. I was like, I can't be asked. I'm knackered. I'm going to go up to my room and, and, and have a phone call with the kids. So I phoned Nick about half a seven and she said, yeah, everything's fine. Don't worry. You know, you know, just relax and uh, I'll speak to you later on. So put the phone down and uh, I drifted off to sleep at about eight o'clock and uh, I woke up at about half past 11 with the phone ringing but it was on charge across the other side of the room so I couldn't get to it um, when I did get to it there was a message from Nick on there saying can you ring me as soon as you get this so yeah, no worries I'll, uh, I'll I'll give you a call back see what's going on thought there'd be a problem with one of the kids you know maybe not well or needs to go to urgent care something like that so I phoned her back and uh, the first thing she said was um, there's been a bloke hanging around outside the house earlier um and don't get cross with me, but I called the police. I was like, well, why would I get cross with you? I said, That's, you've done the right thing. She, I said, what was, he, you know, what was he doing? She said, well, he was kicking and punching our car. And when I opened the window, tell him to, uh, to, do, to get, get lost, she said, um, he was talking about kids. She said, but I couldn't really understand him, what he was saying. So she said, I just phoned the police and they came. She said, but they were quite rude to me. She said, they kept saying, you know, what's he got to do with you? Why is he talking about your kids? She said, well, you know, it's partly why I'm worried, <laughs> you know. Um, he hasn't got anything to do with my kids. So the police had gone, but they hadn't come back to her to let her know what had happened. Um, and she said, I'm a little bit worried because I can hear banging again. You know, I'm worried that he's come back. He's got the hump because I phoned the police on him and he's, he's going to, you know, have a go at me or something. So I said, all right, look, phone the police, see what they did. So she said, all right. So she's gone onto the other phone, phoned the police, come back to me. She said, they don't really give a shit. They've let him go. So she said, I'm really worried now. I said, look, don't worry, don't panic. Mum and dad are away, they're in Cyprus. Get the keys, they only live around the corner. Just drive the car, get the kids in there, don't even get them dressed. Stay at my mum's for the night and I'll be back tomorrow. Okay, yeah, okay. And then she said to me, uh, did you hear that? I was like, no, I didn't, can't hear anything, only you. She said, there was a big loud bang. I said, no, nope, didn't hear anything. She said, right, I'm just gonna go and check what it was. And then next thing I know, you know, she, she, she screamed, there was someone in the house. And what's going through your mind at that time? Um, you know, instantly, I, I think I screamed, you know, and I, I leapt out of bed because um, I heard I heard Nikki actually say, you know, um, what what do you want? Get out of my house. So I knew someone was in there. It wasn't like there's someone trying to get in. There's someone in there. Um, so uh, I grabbed the hotel phone and I dialed 999 and then it wouldn't work because obviously you have to dial nine first. So I tried again, 9999. Got through to the local police. Um, and I could hear Nikki on the phone, um, kind of um, some, some screams and some like, you know, get away, you know, that kind of stuff. And 
pushing, I could hear sort of a struggle going on. Um, and while I was through to the police, I was trying to sort of relay information to them to say, look, I, I know you can see that I'm in Hull, because obviously it goes through to the local place, but I need you to get me through to the, the force control room in Hertfordshire. I need, I need you to get me through there because there's somebody in my house attacking my wife. And they just couldn't really understand what I was saying. I, and I, as far as I remember, I was articulating it quite well. I was calm. I was like, get me through there now. Someone's attacking my wife. But as the call went on, I started to lose control a little bit because they weren't listening to me. I could hear what was going on on the other line, which was horrendous. Um, and then the woman came on the phone to me and said, um, I, I've managed to locate the Hertfordshire police control room and they've actually got somebody on route to your property now. So don't worry. So I'm sending someone to your hotel. I said, what's, can you hear what's going on on your phone? I said, no, it's gone quiet. It's gone, it's gone completely quiet on the line. And then, then it just suddenly dawned on me that obviously the kids are in there. You know, there were so many thoughts going through my mind at that time. You know, I think deep down... I knew something really awful had happened because of the nature of the screams that were on the phone. I kind of assumed that Nikki was probably dead and I thought the kids were probably next um, and I just lost control. Um, I remember screaming down the phone at this poor operator on the phone, you know, that she was going to be responsible if my, anything happened to my kids because she hadn't acted quick enough and all this kind of stuff and it wasn't her fault. Um, and as soon as I put the phone down to her... And I kept the line open to Nick and I was just talking to her down the phone. I was just saying, you know, stay with me. You know, I know you can hear me. Just please, just don't, don't, don't go. Don't leave me. And uh, I couldn't get up off the floor. My legs were completely gone numb. I just could not get up off the floor. I was just dragging myself up onto the bed, um, trying to make my legs work. And I remember just hitting my legs with my fists and trying to get some feeling back into them so I could get up and go downstairs to the, to the reception and start seeing what was going on. And, uh, and yeah, I managed to pull my jeans on and a T-shirt and I, I went out of the room. I ran down to the, uh, to the reception and I tried to find out the numbers of the rooms that my friends were staying in. And he gave me a couple of numbers. I ran back upstairs and I was knocking on the doors, but of course I forgot they'd all gone out on the piss. <laughs> so they weren't in their rooms. Mm. Uh, and eventually, you know, I just sat down in reception. I just remember sitting there shaking, you know. I couldn't control my arms and my shoulders. They were just shaking, and I was trying to talk to Nick on the phone, and then all of a sudden I heard the children crying on the phone. So I knew they were alive, at least. And, uh, but then I could hear them ask, you know, saying to Mummy, wake up, you know, and one of the kids was saying, why has this happened to our family? And they were only six and three. So something, you know, for them to be sitting there or do whatever they were doing, something awful had happened, and I knew... Uh, and then I heard the paramedics arrive with the police and that's when I cut the line off. I didn't want to listen to any more. And at least I knew the kids were kind of safe. At least I knew that someone was there with them. But it seemed like forever that that took, you know. Um, but it, in reality, it was probably only about three or four minutes in its in entirety of that phone call. Um, and then I just sat downstairs waiting for the police to arrive in the hotel. How long did they arrive to come and see you? Uh, they were there in about 20 minutes. Um, they took me into the back room. Um, they knew what was going on. They knew that they were in contact with the, with the Hertfordshire police. Uh, and there was this, it, this big Yorkshire cop, and he was huge. He was about six foot five. He was a big bloke, and he was just sitting there, and he had his hand on my shoulder, and I remember him saying, just, just try not to panic, you know. We're going to find out what's going on. And the, the female lady, uh, police officer, she came back and said, right, listen, your children are fine. Your children are absolutely fine. They're unharmed. Just know that that's okay. I'm still trying to find out about your wife. Uh, and then, um, and then, yeah, she she went away again. She came back. Look, she said, "I'm sorry, Mr. Cross, to tell you your wife has died." And I just fell onto this copper, this big bloke, and he was just hugging me, and I was just sobbing my heart out. And I knew, but you know, you need that final confirmation before it actually starts to sink in, or you know, hits home that what's gone on. Um, and then it was the start of a long journey back in the in the back of a police car. How long did it take to get home? Four hours. The thoughts, man, everything going through your mind. Like, especially if she's already contacted the police as well. There must have been a lot of hate and rage then. Like, like blaming yourself and other people and, and constant going round and round in your mind like, on that drive back. And what was the police's excuse how, why you get released the first time? Um, well, there was a full IPCC investigation because obviously they'd been called before and, and, then, uh, and then something happened afterwards, so that has to be as an automatic process. But 
Honestly, when I got the report back from the IPCC, I think I've seen better projects put together by GCSE students. It, it was shit as far as I was concerned. It was not very thorough. Um, there were clear mistakes made by the police that night. And out of all of this, you know, you've got the guy that did it, you've got, you know, the own guilt that I felt about myself being away from home and everything else. The only anger I've ever felt is towards that local police for not doing something that night because of the mistakes they made and the, and the stuff that came out in that IPCC report of where police officers did have a chance to actually save her while the guy was in the house and they didn't do it. They had a chance and they didn't do it. Yeah, so that plays in your mind. Yeah, uh, big time. Every day, and really enough. Yeah. Especially when anniversaries and that come. Like, yeah. That's so, when everything plays back. Even speaking about it now, it'll bring up a, a lot of emotion and stuff. But definitely. Y you can understand why you would be angry at, especially at something like that, because that's every husband's worst nightmare, every father's worst nightmare, like, to think that your kids are in danger, your wife's in mm. danger, and there's nothing you can do. Like, yeah. It's constant, <clears throat> a battle, like... I've, like I said, we spoke at the very start, like I've lost many people to serious stuff and you blame yourself, could have done more, could have helped them, like could have told them not to go with that person or stop going around with that person yeah. and you kind of let them go. But with yourself, it's out of your hands because mm. <clears throat> but obviously you play over different scenarios. Could have, I, I could have maybe not took that job on. I, I could have, the police could have done more like, it's all ifs and buts as well, isn't it? it? Is, That's yeah. the scary thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole reason that the police actually got there so quick, because um, what he did after he, he uh, killed Nick, he went upstairs to the kids' bedrooms, um, put the knife down on the side, and then grabbed them out of their beds and took them, uh, dragged them down the stairs and was off, was going to leave the house with them. It was only the fact that the police were at the back gate of the house and told him to obviously stop at that point. But the reason they were there was because... 20 minutes earlier, he had smashed the window next door and gone into his house and the police had been called. Um, and so when he actually smashed our back window, our patio door, the police were already in the kitchen next door and they heard, heard the window go. And the, 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 uh, the police officer that was in the kitchen said that his thought process was, I don't want to go through the broken door that's already there and over the fence, which would be the quickest route, in case I cut myself on the broken glass. And I just thought, aren't you supposed to run towards the danger, <laughs> not away from it? And that really stuck in, you know, really grated on me that somebody had that chance to just go straight through that door. It's no more than 10 yards. And instead went out the front door, out the front, could see Nicky banging on the bathroom window, screaming for help. And then, you know, it took an age to go all the way around the end of the terrace and back to the alleyway where the, where the back gate was by then, everything had gone, you know. How many injuries did Nicola have? Uh, ten. Stab wounds? Yeah. And how, when you hear that he had your kids, three and six, and he was taking them away, like, how do you <coughs> deal with that like that? Thought if he would have got away? I remember them saying that um, he was carrying one of the kids when they stopped him, and it... I just collapsed again, you know, into another sort of heap, uh, almost like a relief that um, he had been. He was there really to get the kids, and not not Nikki. She was in the way, and if he'd done anything to them, you know, we, we we wouldn't be here now. We wouldn't be talking now about it for sure. That's for sure. Yeah, do you think that's where you had to find the strength and dig deep? Is because the kids were still here. Yeah, absolutely. I always talk about it with um, when I when I when I talk around strong men, and I talk about um, how I coped. And it was this line of clarity. And I talked about the, the, uh, the police drive home four hours in the back of this car. And even then, where I was a complete mess, um, and I was starting to get flashbacks already, I, was starting, I could still hear the conversation playing over in my mind. I felt like I was underwater, like I couldn't hear what the police officers were saying to me because I was still in the moment. But I just had this line of clarity going through. I, I still remember it just going through my mind. You need to make sure the kids grow up happy, confident adults you need to do what Nick would have done you need to make sure that happens and that was there from the very start um, and that's never changed never wavered mm -hmm. so how long did it take before it went to court um, 16 months it was in and out of court for a while but um, there was a lot of delays with getting him into a secure psychiatric facility because he could only go to Broadmoor or Rampton um, and they were, they were just you know overloaded with 
with patients already, so they couldn't do the psychiatric assessments they needed to do. Eventually, when they got him into Rampton, it took another few months to observe and assess and, and write reports. And finally, they came back and um, the doctor who did the report, he was apparently the most respected forensic psychologist in the country. And he said it's the clearest case of you know, delusional paranoid schizophrenia um, he's ever seen. Did you ever come face to face with this kid? Yeah. What was that like for the first time? Um, it was in court when it was the sentencing, which was obviously um, a hospital order, indefinite hospital order. Um, he looked totally different to what he did in the in the newspapers. Uh, in the newspapers, he was obviously very skinny, um, very withdrawn, you know, and um, just pale and, and vacant. And um, honestly, sitting behind the glass in court, he, he was obviously he'd blown up quite a lot, whether that's the medication or you know what they've been feeding him, I don't know, but. He, and he just looked lost. He didn't look like he did. He didn't look evil. He just looked like a lost so, soul. Yeah, fucking hell, bro. Like, yeah, I can... Like, sitting there and thinking, that like, Because he... Get, was it manslaughter? He, he, play, he played guilty? Is that correct? Guilty to manslaughter by diminished responsibility, yeah. But he could be out potentially 25 years? He could be out in 10. What? Yeah. So this is this is what, I, what, what got me as well. Um, the... The forensic psychologist stood up in court and said, if he responds to treatment, there's no reason why he couldn't be back in society in 10 years. And that really got me. Um, because, you know, although I wasn't angry at him, I've never felt an ounce of anger towards him, which is very, very strange. Why is that? I don't know. Whether it's the logic that sits in my brain with mental illness and I just accept that he didn't, he wasn't in control. Um, and you have to accept that. Yeah. Um... I think that's what it is. Um, but, yeah, angry at the system, I think, as well. You know, that we come back to a bit that anger. It's at the system where if he does respond to treatment, he could be out, and then you have to make sure that there's restrictions in place as to where he can go afterwards because I don't want the kids ever seeing him again. I don't want us ever see him again because you don't know what you might what might happen. That anger might come out that's been it might have been suppressed, you know. But um, so far, he's not responded to any treatment. He's still away with the fairies and it's yeah. six years yeah but that's still scary to think that somebody who murdered your wife and potentially going to murder your kids could be walking the streets after 10 years mm. but sometimes sentences are too lenient <clears throat> in many different cases but like you say the system is flawed the system's there it's got cracks everywhere yeah and um it's scary to think that he could potentially be on the fucking streets because then that becomes an extra added pressure on your own life yeah. your kids lives like you try and move on but that's something you'll need to deal with for the rest of your life you know yeah. you know the score with it like it's, um, it's trying to make your life as comfortable as possible where you're not reliving those moments yeah. certain smells or certain noises can trigger things like it does with me anyway yeah. like I think fuck and then it puts you in a downer for your whole day mm. because something's triggered you from 10 years ago 5 years ago whatever yeah. it is like. so going through the process of the court case and that because that's an extra burden on yourself because there's never any closure Yeah, but when you go up it's a he got the sentence of manslaughter yep. and had to serve, was it a minimum of 25 years though? No, it was just... But then they can't just change just, that, just yeah. in, indefinite. Yeah. Indefinite. <clears throat> but they say 10 years, but it potentially could be in yeah. there for the rest of his life could anyway, be, yeah. 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 But it's still scary to think that he could adjust yeah. and, and if he's got mental health issues, listen, they can trick the system as well yeah. like sometimes. But it's to go through all that then, when did you start finding, okay... What was the day that you realised that you needed to work on yourself and seek help and ask for professional help to then discuss these topics? Like, yeah. Because that ain't easy. People, no. Everybody goes through trauma, <clears throat> but nobody ever really addresses that to then. You've got to face it head on to heal, yeah. I believe. But for yourself, how fast? Because you, did you not move fast to go and get help straight no. away? No? No, because, um, as I said, I, I grew, up, grew up with a really big group of mates and, you know, quite macho guys. Nobody had, who I knew had been um, to seek counselling for anything. Um, as far as I knew, somebody might have problems, but they'd never spoken about it. Um, I was looking at my my granddad, who's a Second World War veteran. You know, D-Day landings, he's still alive, he's 96, he's still going well. Um, and he's never spoken about any of that stuff, you know, in the war. He'll, he'll tell you a funny story or two, but he won't tell you anything about the, the horrors he saw or mm -hmm. people that he lost or friends he lost. 
Um, and, it, and, he de- and, he, and he nursed my nan as well all the way through her cancer battle until she passed away. And he, he's never, as far as I know, he's never spoken about that either. So I was looking to people in my life for inspiration, you know, and, and, and as far as I was concerned at that point, you know, I needed to show toughness. And what I thought toughness was, was clamming up, you know, sucking it up, sticking my chest out and saying, I'm going to get on with it and I will, I'll beat this on my own. But with the PTSD, you know, the grief is one thing, but, you know, the grief hadn't even settled in then. The PTSD, the trauma symptoms, the flashbacks and, the, and being in, stuck in that episode, it was constant. And I thought it was going to subside, you know, as time went on. And I thought, right, tomorrow I'll wake up and I won't have a bad dream tomorrow night and I'll get a bit of a breather. Didn't. It just kept going. And I, I would find myself <clears throat> just sat on the bed just talking to myself and I'd be actually saying the same words that I spoke to Nikki on the phone. I'd be actually doing the conversation again and trying to almost change it in my mind, you know? Sometimes I think, you know, I wish I was like Liam Neeson in Taken. Yeah, <laughs> I could just say what I wanted to say on the yeah. phone and, yeah. and I would make it all right. But um, I was stuck in this, stuck in the trauma, I was stuck in the episode and I knew my son was as well. He was six and um, he was having nightmares instantly and he was petrified. Um, and he'd created a lot of make-believe around what had happened, and that's a defense mechanism that children do. My daughter was three. She wasn't doing any of that. She was, as far as we could see, she was acting normally. She was missing mummy, but she wasn't getting any bad dreams, and she was able to sleep, but my son was petrified. So I asked for some support through the victim support charity um, for my son for some trauma counseling. I'd read that if you get trauma counseling in the first 45 days after an event, for children especially, it's it's the best time to do it. So we got that sorted. And within three sessions, um, Stanley's bad dreams had gone. And I just thought it was amazing. And then I realized that if I didn't sort myself out, it was probably about eight weeks after, didn't sort myself out, I'm not gonna be able to look after these kids because the the stuff was getting worse and I was feeling worse. Um, So eventually I sat down in the room with with my caseworker. I just said, look, I, I don't really have anything to lose. Let's see if I can talk to someone about the trauma because I I can't really cope with what's going on. Um, I can't function day to day. I can't, you know, I can't process anything. My mind is consumed. I've got no memory. Um, And so she said, yeah, okay, I think it's a a good idea and I'll I'll arrange that for you straight away. Um, That's the best decision I ever made. Unbelievable that to make that decision, especially when you're going through trauma, you can't, Think straight. You no. can't make decisions because you think you're fine. Yeah. For over ten years, I thought I was fine, <laughs> and then I look back at old photos and how bloated I was and how depressed. And when you talk about lost souls, that's what I was—a lost soul. Like I yeah. couldn't handle the pain of losing my dad to leukemia, my uncles to murder, my best friend to suicide, and I hid behind the pain for years, for years and years, brother. Like yeah. I had masked it with so much drugs and drink and anger and violence and women and all the bullshit of the yeah. day because. I was too much pride to ask for help. I had too much pride to come forward and say, look, I'm struggling. Yeah. I'm struggling. Now I'm in a good place. I still battle, but I tend to now reach out more and speak to people say, look, I'm not really having a good day. And then we have a discussion and half an hour later it's gone. Yeah. I feel great. The pain is not there because as soon as you open up, that's when you can learn to heal. That's when you can learn to yeah. adapt. Like, they say time's a healer, but it's not really true. Like, I believe as time goes on, the pain isn't as strong. The pain's still there, but the connection isn't as powerful as it was. You still have your moments and your down days. That yeah, that's just life. I think that everybody has them, but it just goes to show with people like yourself and people watching this that people can push through the pain and still kick on in life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the way I looked at it to start with was that if I spoke out what I was, I was weaker, you know. But um, having gone through it, gone through the counselling, learned the tools that I needed to learn, learned about myself more, learned how to cope with the flashbacks and the intrusive thoughts. I, as I came through it, I thought, actually, you know what, I'm getting stronger. I'm actually getting stronger as a person. I, I now know how to cope with trauma. <clears throat> you know, I know how to do this. I didn't know that before. So I, I started to see myself as, as rather than damaged, rather than a victim, actually I'm improving. And that's how I started to look at myself. Did you take medication or anything? I did for a while, yeah. I took diazepam just to take the edge off the anxiety that mm-hmm. I was suffering because with PTSD, I was so anxious as well, you know, um, so worried that something bad was going to happen all the time, a constant feeling of dread. 
that feeling when you know when you're in that fight or flight mode it's just that feeling you think there's always someone behind you about something bad's about to happen you know that's the only feel, that's the only way i could describe the feeling like someone was creeping up behind me all the time um and so the doctor gave me diazepam for that um and yeah i used that to help myself relax in the evenings it worked didn't have sleeping tablets but that helped me just to drift off um and then after about six months i was getting to grips with the trauma um there were certain th other things that helped me with the trauma which was actually um seeing the body cam footage from the night because in my mind i'd heard everything that went on but i was creating you know a million and one different scenarios and stories of actually fit visually what happened and i was trying to piece it all together uh, and where was nikki at the end and all this stuff and, uh, and the the police officer the liaison officer he said to me do you want to see the body cam footage i said yeah i do i, I need to see you know, what the house was like, and I need to have that in my mind. And he showed me, and he showed me 10 seconds of just this officer going up the stairs, and there was Nikki sort of laying uh, or sitting backwards against the wall, and she just looked asleep. There was no blood. She didn't look harmed. She just looked asleep. And we turned the video off there. And it wasn't until about a week later when sort of a flashback or trigger happened again that I realised I hadn't thought about it for a week. That was kind of like I needed that end to my story to put that to bed with the mm. with the trauma counselling. So it worked fantastically. Um, but as that came to an end, I noticed how depressed I was. You know, this is the grief coming in now. The, the trauma was subsiding, and the real grief was allowed to come in because until you've got rid of that, you can't process any of the other stuff that's going on in your mind. So I went to the doctors. I said, "Look, I've, I've got, the only way I can describe it is I can't see another happy day in my life. I, this is it." I've, this is the rest of my life now, it's gonna be shit. Every single day that I thought was gonna be good, fun, happy, is now gonna be extra sad. It's not gonna be even remotely good. You know, kids getting married, maybe grandkids. Even like stupid things like Isabella tying her shoelaces for the first time and kids swimming without armbands. All of that was sad and they should have been happy. And I just said to him, I just can't see, I, I, I'd just like to go to sleep and wake up in 50 years when it's all better and the kids are okay and I can see that everything's all right. He said, oh, well, you obviously you're, you're depressed. He said, um, there's a couple of routes we can take here. He said, one is, um, I can give you these tablets, sertraline. He said, and you can take these. Um, and you need to be on them for three or six months before you start to notice a real benefit and impact. He said, but we could review it after nine months and see how you're going, and then we can reduce the dosage and, or, or play around with it, depending on how you're feeling. So I said, okay. He said, but there is also the alternative route, which is um, exercise. He said, you're getting the stomach aches, which I was getting really bad crippling stomach aches. He said, you've got migraines, which I had. He said, this is a buildup of stress hormones in your body. And one way to get rid of that is exercise. He said, you've obviously uh, been a fit bloke before. Are you in the gym still? I said, no, I haven't been to the gym since Nick died. So he said, we well, get back in the gym. So I thought, all right, I'll take his advice. Didn't want to. <laughs> um, but I went home that day, I got the box of sertraline tablets, I took one, and an hour later, I went to get on the exercise bike. I thought, do you know what, I'll, I'll do the tablets and the exercise, because that, that I'm hitting it from both angles. I couldn't, I couldn't pedal the bike. My legs were just numb. Really? Yeah, and I just thought, if this is what these tablets are going to do to me, I don't want to know. And so I binned them completely, first day. Um, that was it, job done. Um, I thought, right, tomorrow um, I'm going to go to the gym just 20 minutes on the treadmill. And that's where I started my journey with the, with the physical exercise and, and, and using it to sort of bring my mood up. Yeah, so it was suicidal thoughts then a lot, but never acting on it because yeah. you had the kids. Yeah, I would say not quite suicidal, but more just, I would, I want this to be taken out of my hands. You know, yeah. if, I, if I go to bed now and don't wake up, I won't be bothered, but I would never hurt myself. Um, I don't think it was pure. It wasn't like real suicidal thoughts. It was just a case I want this pain to be over. Yeah, the screams yeah. and the yeah. noise in the mind. Yeah. How hard was it though to see the body cam footage? Was that your counsellor's idea? Was that your idea to get some closure of other things you were replaying in your mind? Whose idea was that behind to um, that look at was, the trauma? That was, it was kind of put together. The, the, um, the police officer suggested that I could watch <clears> the body cam footage. He said, discuss it with your counsellor. I said, okay. He said, she might want to be there with you when you watch it. Um, and I can't, do you know what? My mind is so fuzzy from that time. I don't remember if she was with us or not. 
when I watched it. I think she might have been. I'm not sure. Um, but we watched the footage, and they said it actually. Do you know what? It could be a it could be a really good thing to to watch it. It could give you that end to your story that you need. It give you the vi- it give you the real visual to the to the sound that you heard, if you like, rather than making up loads of different stories in your head. Um, and it just worked. It just worked unbelievably well. I just needed that last piece of the jigsaw. Um, and almost like it was almost like I was because it was almost like I was able to sort of say goodbye there because I could see her in front of me. Whereas, uh, you know, one of the hardest things of losing someone you will know tragically and, and unexpectedly is you don't get to say goodbye. And that's one of the hardest things. Yeah, that's something that you live with, I think. Yeah. For a, as long as you, you're on this yeah. planet anyway. Like, did you ever have an apology from the police? No. No. Um, they upheld the complaint. I put in about not going back to tell Nikki what they had done after they'd dealt with him because obviously she made the phone call. They went and spoke to him. They should have come back and given her the opportunity to say, do you know what, I think I'm going to go somewhere else tonight or, um, you know, just yeah. have an option. But they didn't. Yeah. They probably, like I say, there's, there's good and bad everywhere. It's probably a, yeah. a thing that they never thought would be as extreme. And but that's, that's why I've tried to tell myself, you know, they didn't know yeah. that was going to happen. But, you know, I argue with that constantly back mm-hmm. and forth. Yeah, that's understandable, though. Like you say, the people who have... The police officers that have came there, showed you the body cam, put your arm around you, that... They're the, amazing. They're amazing, do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's so many good coppers out there. There's, listen, there's so many bad, but they probably thought in their mind it's not as extreme and you're never going to g- see that because to see that, it doesn't happen very yeah. often. It does just... Does that play in your mind as well? Why me? Yeah, I think that's the question. The why is... Um is something that can never be asked, and that's something that the kids still struggle with. I've I've accepted that there is no why. You know, for me, yes, that's that's been a long journey to accept, but I've accepted there is no why. Just bad luck. Um, but for the kids, they're still struggling with the why. Why was it our house? Why did he choose our house? Mm-hmm. Um, because he had been to sort of four or five other houses on the way to ours, knocking on doors and, and mumbling and asking for kids and you know, all this kind of stuff. And people had phoned the police and mentioned that there was somebody in the area that was um, knocking on doors looking for kids. Did they have any previous? No. No, nothing. Um, All that transpired was in the the month leading up to it, um, his housemate said he'd been acting strange, hadn't been to work, just kind of locked himself in his room, Um, been carving names of priests into his legs with with a knife. um, swore blind that this Polish priest had been to see him at his house and told him that he was on sort of some sort of mission. Um, but um, the people we lived with just, you know, they didn't know him well enough. They were just housemates. They weren't even friends, really. Um, they just, you know, just thought he was a bit mad. Yeah. How's the kids now? What are the nine and twelve? Uh, yeah, Isabella's coming up for ten. Stanley's twelve. Um, a work in progress for Stan. Um, he was very much more affected by the trauma than Isabella, as we spoke about earlier. He still needs medication to sleep. He has medication for anxiety. Um, and we are waiting now for more treatment from um, tier three NHS services, specialist mental health for him. Because, um, bless him, he, he's fearful of everything. And it all comes back down to, to that moment um, of feeling just completely unsafe as a, as, as a child. Um, it, it goes right through his life. He has a real low opinion of himself, low self-esteem, low confidence. Um, he plays football, but he, you know he's scared of getting hurt with a tackle. He's scared of the ball. He's scared of all sorts of things. Bless him. We're working on it with him all the time. We try and build him up. Um, but I think you know the professionals that we're now with will will get to the get to help him where, and how he needs it. You know, as he moves into sort of adolescence and and into an adult because you know, I want him to grow up being proud of himself for what he's coped with and what he's handled and what he's been through rather than looking at himself as a victim and a failure and which is how he looks at himself, which is really, really hard to see. Isabella, on the other hand, she's a pocket rocket, um, full of confidence, <laughs> which makes it even harder for Stanley to see, you know, because why is she not affected and I am? Um, but she has her own struggles with that um, loss of relationship. You know, she's got a great relationship with my wife, uh, stepmom Alex. Um, as far as I can see, it's just mother and daughter relationship. But because she lost her mum, she wonders 
is this the same? Am I missing anything? You know, what was it like? And she struggles with that. Um, just wondering what it was like to have mummy around because um, she doesn't really remember properly. Um, we've got memory books, we've got photos, all that kind of stuff. And But the one thing she really clearly remembers black and white is the moment it happened. No oh, yeah. way. Yep. But she remembers it without fear, without emotion. And that's just how yeah. it was at the time for her. It was no, there, there was not fear and there was not emotion. It was just it was just happening. Yeah. Um, and she can still remember it to this day. Yeah, but your son will be a reflection of your strength as well. That he doesn't really not realize it now, but how strong he is to be even here to be pushing I forward. That like, is unbelievable. Yeah. Like for a kid to see that, that like, childhood trauma is the worst kind of trauma, I believe, because it, like I say, it gives you a lifetime of pain yeah. and misery but <clears throat> as time goes on and he will get stronger yeah. he will realise how strong he is like he's still growing he's still going through adjustments his yeah. hormones are changing like but once he gets older and he'll be a reflection of you and obviously you're already proud but he's going to go and make mass changes where people then follow his footsteps and then he can guide people yeah. out, the, out the darkness that he's been in for so long because <clears throat> that's where your strength is that's the people who do make the changes and then help yeah. change others as the ones who've seen some serious struggles the ones yeah. who've seen some serious darkness that that's the ones who can change lives and mm. like i say your son's going through his moments but with you working on yourself and keep pushing forward your son will only see that as a, a strength also obviously yeah. it can be it's your kids you're there to protect them and we'll feel sometimes like i feel that i feel you sometimes as a father because the first few years of my kids life i was out partying so I'd missed it all. Mm. This is only the first time I felt like a proper father the last three, four years because now I'm being a man and, and owning it and yeah. my past m mistakes and my own faults and my own problems because this life is 100% our responsibility. Mm. Nobody's coming to save us. We need to fucking get out and graft for it ourselves and <laughs> yeah. try and break the connections of the pain. But yeah. it can be done and like a living proof that people can make changes and can... You can't really learn from that because it's, it was out of your hands but you can try and accept the pain to try and break it it's fucking hard though like as much as we can talk about it but this is why these conversations are so powerful not oh, yeah. only you speaking helps others but it also helps me because i relive a lot of stuff and then just speaking about it puts it into existence mm. and it doesn't have the same power over you how paranoid do you become now does it still heightened or is it still okay now that like, are you constantly locking doors or looking over your shoulder? How does it? How do you feel? The locking of doors has stopped. <clears throat> um, that moment when I realised if someone wants to get into your house and hurt you, they can. Mm -hmm. Unless you've got shutters and bolts on every single window and door. Um, it took a long while for that to come back to normal. When I first met Alex, um, I was still locking up dead bolts and everything else on the doors. But at the same time, in my mind, I knew, you know, I've still got great big patio windows and everything else. If someone wants to get in, they're getting in. But I didn't sleep very well. Um, Alex would always tell me, um, you don't sleep, you're up at, the, at any sound, you're up and you're about and you're moving around the house and you're checking on things. And that was the case. She said, the only time I ever used to see you sleep was when the kids were at nannies and granddads for the night. And she said, you know, you'd be like, I can't wake you up. Because that was my protective instinct coming out, obviously. But um, now... I'm good with that. You know, I, I do analyze everyone I see. <laughs> you know, I can be on, I was on train today and I was just looking around and it's just a natural thing for me to look for danger now, I think. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, a long walk from the tube here through um, <laughs> Pat, Patmore Estate or whatever yeah. it was. I was, kind of, I, was, I was at a gentle jog by the time uh -huh. I got halfway through uh -huh. it. <laughs> but um, no, I'm, I'm good with that. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not always thinking something bad's going to happen, but I am more aware. Yeah. yeah. But I, you can never be too safe anyway, as mm. you know, as time goes on. But it's good to be. But then again, where do you find the, the thin line of try to let your kids be free without being too overprotective as well? But then again, if anything ever happened, God forbid, that, then it's the fucking old emotions come back as well. That, can we ever be too protective over our kids? I don't think we can, but yeah, it's I, a, really, I am too overprotective where I want them to be able to trust me. But I just know how dark and bad the world can be as well mm. there's still a beautiful place there's still amazing things happen there's beautiful there's beauty everywhere but when you go through some pain and darkness like you, you kind of you don't want to force too much shit on them as well because then you push them away yeah i mean with stanley he's all right going out in the daytime with his friends he doesn't worry about that it's just you know the evenings and, and being at home and, and specifically in his bedroom because that's where it obviously happened not in this house but he's at our last house but 
I'm always encouraging him to go out more with his friends. You know, I don't mind that. I'm quite happy to let him go off. He's got his phone. He can contact me. And then Isabella this week, she said, can I walk to school on my own now? She's like, coming up 10. I was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> it's only like 300 <clears throat> yards across the road. I was like, no, not yet. And then she saw one of her friends walking to school on his own. And she was like, see, Eddie's, Eddie's going. Why can't I? I was just like, I'm not ready for you to walk. I'm, I'm not ready for you to mm-hmm. walk yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we'll, we'll start sort of like, you know, walking halfway and letting her go the rest, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It is, it's so hard because, you know, your, your, your bubble of, of the world, your innocence of the world, even though you see so much shit on the news about someone's stabbed here, someone's been shot, you know, someone's been raped or the, mm-hmm. there's a war going on. It's not real until something bad happens to you and then i remember we don't watch the news anymore because if i do see something like that i feel it and if somebody's lost a child or someone's lost a a, a wife or anything like that from a stabbing or mugging or something like that is on the news i feel it and i don't want to feel it it's it's hard because it's it's, the news is real and when somebody has been through a traumatic thing like that and, and you've lost someone in that way the news feels like it should be on at like 11 o'clock at night. It shouldn't be on six o'clock for all the, with all this stuff on for kids and everything else to hear. But yeah. you have to go back to realising that until this happened to you, it didn't feel real anyway. Yeah, seeing all that stuff in the news, you're thinking, that's sad. But then you just get back home, your daily, your daily routine, yeah. and you're thinking it's never going to happen to you. But like we spoke earlier, events that can happen, good or bad to anybody, mm. all across the board, all walks of life on this planet. Like, that's where you'll find out who your true character is. Yeah. Do you lie down and quit or do you stand up and fight and that's all you've done is stood up and fought back mm-hmm. like it's not going to let it defeat you like you've still got kids there you've still got a beautiful wife now he's married now yeah got married um, mate. two years yeah. ago yeah this was one of the women who helped you as well well no that's a common misconception oh, actually that? yeah the uh, the papers love that one um, no I met Alex um, at a charity evening for one of her friends that mm. I think she was running the marathon all the time and I just I, I just went to the pub where they were and I met her there and we just said hello and then um great sort of we're kind of sort of like softly match made by um one of alex's friends um um later on but no she it turned out when i started talking to her that um she was in psychology um she used to work at brixton prison as a psychologist there um and when we first met she'd just taken a new job to do child mental health so I was like, what? You know, mm-hmm. this is, uh, you know, like a gift from heaven. You know, you couldn't really have asked for anyone better to, to sort of be involved with. And um, yeah, she's amazing. She's absolutely amazing. And to say, you know, she wasn't one of the professional people that was put in to help us, but she's helped us um, probably more than she'll ever realise. Yeah, because there's, it's the baggage that comes with it mm. as well. To un- unpack all your fucking shit, your screams at night, the, the, the sweats, like yeah. up and down looking at windows, like... That's a lot for somebody. The people who's not in that field don't understand it. Like, mm. So for a woman to come in and understand it is perfect for your... It would calm your own soul. Yeah. It would help your kids progress in life. Like, that's when you then think like, people come into your life as a... I always say this, but a lesson or a blessing. Like, it's, um, she's obviously come in for the right reasons, a blessing to then yeah. try and help you heal while still probably try to heal herself because we're all trying to heal in, mm. in, in some degree. That. Like, is that a major factor in why you're you're more chilled and understanding towards everything that's happened? Yeah, I think I'm a completely different person than I was six years ago. I don't stress about money, really. Um, I don't stress about my job, ever. Because, you know, if I don't like that job, I'll just go and get another one. Um, I don't stress about um, um, silly things like a bit of road rage, all that sort of stuff anymore. You know, if someone catch up in the car it's right you know i'm just more i don't know what's happened but i've just chilled out you know um i've realized that there's so much more important things in life than getting stressed out about the normal rat race stuff um all i really care about is the health and well-being of my family and friends um and uh, doing good things for other people that's it yeah. Um, I don't have to worry about um, the stresses and strains of normal life. If, I, as I say, if I lost my job tomorrow, of course I've got bills to pay. But I'll just go and get another job. Yeah, that's the best way to see it. But you, you've also got to count your blessings because a lot of people who aren't of you go through trauma, go the opposite route: mm. violence, revenge, hatred, hating on the world, fill up with drink, drugs. Like you've went the complete other side. Where do you know what is? 
bad shit happens, but catastrophes happen. I need to accept that. Yeah. I need to move on and protect myself, protect my kids, protect my wife. Like other people who I interview as well go the other way. They want more violence because they're so caught up in the trauma yeah. that they then give other people trauma and pain. Like it's mad like how you're in control of your choices. Obviously with mental health sides, some people like we spoke earlier, that kid with a mental health his mind's gone wired up differently but people majority of people are in control of their choices they are in control of how they feel and what they're doing they can make the changes to then because if you're conditioned for so long to think something's normal it, it, you've ingrained it in your brain where yeah. it has become normal even though if it, whether it's good or bad like it's just mad that we still don't understand the brain we still don't have watched so many videos i've read so many books to try and understand where the pain come from like yeah. my life is going great and I'm doing great things but I still don't feel happy I feel bursts of happiness when I've achieved a goal but for maybe 10 20 seconds and then it goes away and then I think fuck and then I get myself down because I think I should be more happy than what I really am is that not because maybe I'm not showing enough gratitude I don't know but because mm. I'm always wanting more as well I'm constantly trying to raise the bar to show and give my kids a bit of freedom that I never had as well yeah. but I know it's all external stuff it's all external noise and I know everything is up here if I'm feeling good or bad but yeah. it is life we're still learning we still kick on like when the SAS Who Dares Wins came across yeah and that, that's where I seen your story and like yeah. they're tough bastards who are, who are talking to you like these are stone cold killers who've yeah. seen trauma and pain so they could probably relate to you in a lot but you've seen them getting quite emotional and these guys probably are trained not to show emotion like when mm. you told your story you seen like the shock factor how did that come about for you well it started off really with that journey from the uh, doctor's office when he told me to get back in the gym um so i was set about you know physical exercise get myself back into a better place and i just noticed you know that those half an hour that i was in the gym i was <clears throat> i was focused on what i was doing rather than focusing on the shit that was going on in my mind and i just noticed those half an hour breaks i was getting here and there were obviously helping me through the mm. day. So I put myself more and more into it, more and more into the, the physical exercise and gradually felt better and better from it. Um, and it helped, I would say, the, the, the physical activity, the gym, the running, the outdoor training was the main thing that helped me lift my mood out of the depression and helped me cope with the grief um, and definitely made my body resilient to the stress that the emotions were putting on it. Um, the headaches went, the, the stomach aches went, all the problems that I was getting physically, it was a manifestation of that emotional pain, uh, went. So I realised that the more fit I was, the more I could just deal with my mental stresses and it wouldn't impact my body. So I'd make myself healthier that way. And uh, I've got to a point, I think it was not long after Nick died actually, the first series of SAS Who Dares Wins went out on telly and it, that was something I managed to get a little bit of a break from where I was able to watch something I enjoyed and mm. in amongst the, the crap that was going on, I was able to enjoy what I saw and I just thought, this is, this is right up my street, I love this sort of stuff. Um, and Middleton obviously stood out um, <clears throat> and I just thought it was fantastic. And then the second series came on a year later and I saw Ephraim Brynin on there who talked about losing his son in Afghan. And at that point, I was thinking, oh, should I apply for this show? You know, I, I'm fit and strong and I love it. Maybe I'd love, love to give it a go. I've always um denied about that military side that I talked about when I, when I was younger. I'm not sure if I wanted to do it or not. And then it got to, it got to May 2017 and we were preparing for a fun day, um, a fundraising day for um, a local charity that I set up with some friends called Nikki's Wishes. It's, we support bereaved kids and... We, I was sitting there in the morning and something just appeared on my Twitter feed, like a notification from Minnow Film saying um, SAS Who Dares Wins applications are open. So I thought, fuck it, I'll just fill out a form. So I just remember sitting at the breakfast bar and I just filled out this form and emailed it off. Thought I wouldn't hear nothing more. The next thing I know, I'm getting an email saying, can you come for a casting day? <laughs> I don't know what entails, but they said just fitness test, basically. And if you get through the fitness test, you might get an interview with one of the producers. So I did the fitness test. That was hard. That was a mile and a half in, in nine and a half minutes, a bleep test to level 10 at the minimum, and then loads of strength stuff. It was quite hard. I got through it, and then I had a chat with Naomi, the, the producer, just spoke openly, really, and she, I think she was quite surprised at how open I was at talking about what had happened. Um, and then I didn't hear anything for a while. I thought, oh, well, you know, that's kind of gone. 
sort of took my foot off the gas on the training a little bit. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, got a call saying, um, you, you're through to the next stage. We'd like you to come for um, a psychological interview um, with Howie, the, the, the psychological guy. And if he thinks you're all right, you know, you've gone to the next stage, which is a Institute of Sport Fitness test with the old mask on, measuring your oxygen, all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> Went through those, no problem. Didn't hear anything again. I thought, that's it, I've, 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 I've flunked out now. Went on holiday, was in Tenerife with uh, my wife and her, uh, well, she wasn't my wife then, but with Alex and the kids and her family. And I uh, got a call from Naomi saying, we want you to come for your, um, your proper interview next week. You're, you're, on the, you're on the show. I was like, you know, I've taken my foot off the gas in the training. We're only like three weeks away from actually going out there in where we were supposed to be going. So the next thing I know, I'm running up Mount Tady, <laughs> like Nigel Benn in a training camp, mm-hmm. trying to get fit again. Um, but yeah, got onto the show. The whole way it's done is amazing. They, don't, they tell you nothing. Get to the airport at this time, wearing your army boots that we've supplied you, and we want you to bring a wash bag, 10 pairs of pants, and that's it, basically. That's all you need. So you turn up for the airport, don't know where you're going, don't know where you're... I'd prepared for cold weather, really. I've been laying in streams and lakes and all that sort of stuff mm. just to sort of acclimatise really quickly. And of course, next thing we know, I'm landed in Morocco <laughs> and uh, 40 degree heat in the Sahara Desert. Um, <clears throat> And they, they give you a couple of days to sort of get used to the heat and they run you around in the desert and they don't really let you sleep. So by the time you get to camp, you're knackered. Um, and then you're just running on adrenaline. And they do it so well that you don't feel like you're on a TV show. You know, you don't really see cameras. Um, and yeah, then it, then it starts. The minute you see, see Ant and Billy and Foxy and Ollie um, was being bundled into a helicopter on the first morning in my jeans that I shouldn't have worn, I should have worn shorts. Um, and then flown over this lake by a dam um, in a helicopter with your Bergen. Billy says, um, he was the guy that was in my chopper, and he says, uh, right, if you don't swim when you hit the water, and now I'm thinking he's going to push me out this fucking helicopter now, we're about five, six metres up. <laughs> um, if you don't swim, you're going to drown, so just start swimming. And he said, if you let go of your Bergen, you're in fucking trouble because that's what floats. Okay, so the next thing he's just shoved me out of the helicopter. <laughs> and I landed flat on my back. And it really hurt, but I managed to keep hold of the burger and swim to shore. And it all just started from there. It was fantastic. It really was. Was that a good challenge for yourself to then realise how strong you are and what you've overcome? Yeah, it was. You know, I, I applied for the show because I knew where I'd come from. You know, I knew how bad I'd felt. Um, I knew what I was going through. And at that point... I was just being positive in my life. I said, just say yes to everything. Just be positive. And I felt like a Superman. I felt like I could take on the world. I felt like I was ready for anything. If I can overcome and get through and keep going what I've got through, there's, I can't, there's nothing I can't do. So I got on, the, on into the camp. Um, and the minute they took my phone away from me at um, Casablanca Airport, I started to feel that tightness coming in, in here again, the anxiety and the, and the worry, because I hadn't been out of contact with the kids and I hadn't been away from the kids since the night happened in that, those two years. And that anxiety just drained the energy out of me. It got worse and worse as the time went on. Um, but um, I absolutely loved being in there, but being away from the family was, was hell. And when they said to me, um, your knee's too bad to carry on, you know, I probably could have pushed it and said, look, I'm not going anywhere. And they would have had to keep me in for a bit longer. But at that point, I was just, I needed to see the family. Mm -hmm. I I was mentally, I wasn't as strong as I thought I was. Um, Physically, I definitely wasn't as strong as I thought I was. Definitely not as young as I thought I was. (laughs) I was the oldest guy left in that course. Um, And um, it was a struggle, you know. I I felt like I was back at the bottom bottom rung again for a while. Um, I wasn't as fit and strong as I thought I was. I wasn't as mentally tough as I thought I was because I was worried about the kids again. And it, it gave, but it did, rather than it knocking me back, it, I just took it as a lesson, you know? Yeah. But you can't think that, mate. You're one of the strongest guys I've ever came yeah. across, mate, and I genuinely mean that. Like, to even do that show t- just two years after what happened shows you your kind of character. Mm. You want to test yourself, push the boundaries, and fight through that. <clears throat> it's weird that I'm doing, I've got a boxing fight yeah, coming up in a few days, and at sparring at the start and stuff, you're scared. And then when you do it, you, you kind of start enjoying it. You kind of start enjoying the pain. And that's a fucking mad experience that, because you realise <clears throat> we ain't made a glass. Yeah. We are strong. Every individual's strong. 
everybody is like yeah. it's just life like it's just we all, all we're all built strong we're all built for comfort but the brain can take you to places that you can that you can you can't even imagine mm. like yeah everybody is capable everybody's capable of change everybody's capable of raising the bar everybody's capable of fighting their fears and anxieties and depression you're living proof that you've done it you're still here to tell the tale you've got mm. a smile on your face yes you've been through some dark times and trauma will that always be there of course but Will it be there as frequent? No, of course not, because you can have... I always say this as well, but <clears throat> if you have more bad days than good, then something needs to fucking change. You need mm. to wake up and realise that you don't need to live there. You, you shouldn't be accepting that. Go get help. Ask for help. Like, go on to Google and search local areas that are willing to help you for free. Like, people can make the changes, but you need to want to change it. And like we touched mm. on earlier, like, this life's 100% your responsibility. We don't know what kind of curveballs is going to be through at us, but it's down to us how we react to it. And yeah. that's the special thing about it, that like, people can realise that. You are realised that at a very start of, because if you let that trauma go one or two years, fuck knows where you might have ended yeah. up. And that's a scary thought. But after the SES then, what were you doing? What was life like then? It was really good. Um, <clears throat> it was it was um, just family orientated, you know, um, working, family. Um, I was sort of formulating some ideas in my mind about um, creating something to help other people. I'd done some volunteering with um, victim support to do peer support, just on the phone, talking to other people that had lost people by murder. Um, did a couple of days training with the victim support um, charity where there was six other people in a room, all lost someone by murder, and we were doing that like, volunteer training. And I was, I was dreading it. I was thinking, that, oh, I've got to go and be with these other people that have lost... By murder, mm. I don't know if, if they're like downbeat and stuff. I don't think I can handle yeah, it. And depressing kind of thing. Do you know what? It was two of the most fun days. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Everybody there was there, and the connection was instant mm -hmm. because of the, the shared life experience. But we were talking about things, and we were just, you know, what had happened to each other, and we were like, oh Jesus Christ, you know, that's 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 terrible. That I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want yours over mine, kind of, kind of thing. And it was yeah. almost like the worst ever game of top yeah, trumps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we were all laughing about <laughs> it, you know. Um, but it taught me that connection. <clears throat> and um, I was still formulating these ideas of, of what I wanted to do for men specifically because there, there was that gap when I was looking for support. Loads of, loads of offers, mm. but nothing that was attractive to me. I'd done the counselling, but I'd progressed now. I wanted something else. And I didn't want to just constantly sit in a room with a, with a stranger and, and pour my heart out all the time. I'd done the trauma work, but it wasn't right for me for the grief. It wasn't right for the anxiety for, as far as I was concerned, all the depression. But there was nothing else out there. Um, not designed for men. It was all traditional type stuff, which we normally shy away from. You know, we just we just don't like it. We don't go to the doctors for fuck's sake. We won't even yeah, speak yeah, to yeah. anyone. <laughs> so um, went on SAS, and that taught me like the brotherhood side of things. That how quickly these military units obviously bond, and they don't know each other to start with, and, and you can see how tight they get. It's all about common common goal in mind and living together, washing, eating, all that sort of stuff and being amongst other people. And that gave me the idea for um, like a, a retreat, um, for, for a bereavement retreat for men. And it would be based on that sort of camp um, ethic and that ethos where we all wash together and all that and, and just, just get on. So I approached Ollie. I put these, I put these um, ideas down on a bit of paper and um, went to see Ollie from, from the show, Ollie Ollison. And, Great guy. Yeah, and he said, um, he said, yeah, I think it's a great idea. I think it's got legs, you know, let's have a chat. I'll, I'll speak to the guy that I do some business stuff with and we'll, we'll, we'll work out a plan. And um, he said, I think I know someone else that might want to be interested in, in getting involved. And that was Ephraim from series two. So he put me and Ephraim together. And then, um, yeah, me and Ephraim hit it off. And we've just gone from there, really. We've just, we've just gone idea after idea after idea. And today, Strongman has gone from that idea on two sides of A4 paper to a national charity supporting hundreds of men. Yeah, that's amazing. Where can people get involved for people who's maybe struggling just now? Yeah, so go to our website, which is strongmen.org.uk. Mm -hmm. um, on there, you'll find all about our services. Um, we aren't your traditional help. You know, we, we, we run camps where you can come and you can climb Snowden and you can do some adrenaline sports and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And nobody's forced to sit in a room and share. If you want to talk about your, your stuff, you can. Um, it's just, it's, it's a fun weekend away. And we do some phone support as well, you know, peer support where you can speak to one of our volunteers. All of those volunteers are men that have been through one of our weekends. So they know about the strong men ethos. Um, but we just had one recently and it's, it's a case of 
tell a man he's got to go in, in a room with a stranger, you know, and mm-hmm. talk about his feelings. He's just going to go, no, 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 I'm, I'm going down the pub. Fuck off. Yeah. Um, but you tell a guy, guy he's going away for a weekend with a load of other blokes, they happen to have experienced bereavement like you, I'll go do a bit of that. And the talking just happens. Just naturally happens yeah. instantly. It organically starts from five minutes after they arrive at camp. By the time they go home on the Sunday, they've made 20, 25 new mates that have all been through something like them. A support network that they never previously had. They've realised the benefits of actually talking about their problems. They've got some physical exercise. They've kick-started a healthier lifestyle if they weren't already. And they go on just growing after that. You know, the, the impact of that weekend on the guys that we have is from life-changing to life-saving. It's amazing. Yeah, that's what it's all about. That's where the growth is. It's that's amazing. where the happiness is. That, yeah. Um, like helping other people is where you find your true blessing. Like, and as human beings, we're all under the same sky. We all breathe the same air. Like we're so all disconnected with each other. When really, man, we should all be helping each other. We should all be loving mm-hmm. each other and helping each other up. Like, Human beings have got the potential to do that. Like over 7 billion people in the world, it's scary yeah. to think that, imagine everybody was on the same frequency and fought the same, but yeah. maybe one day, maybe not my lifetime, but guys like yourself putting these things in place and showing the world that you can come through pain. And that's where we talk about the darkness of the past because then that shows your light. Like your son, he'll be leading this charity in, in 10 years himself. Like he'll have the younger generation, like he's not alone. Mm. There's kids that have been through that sort of stuff as well at that yeah. age, and I believe your son will be at the forefront. He's just going through the, the, those stages of his life where we're learning and we're growing. We're still going through all our fucking madness. Like, I'm still going through mine. I'm in a good place, but yeah. I still think, fuck me, man. Like, I've still got so much to work on, and sometimes that can get you down as well, but that's just life. Yeah. See, in 2018, when you were coming out the SES show and then everything about your life was all over the news and newspapers because it was new K headlines. Yeah. How was that to adapt to that? Because then everybody knew your story where you couldn't hide it anymore. Yeah, Did it's lot, difficult. Yeah. You know, one of those things oh. that's, that's really difficult, in the, even in the early days, is that feeling of the spotlight. Um, you don't want to go out of your house because you think people are talking about you. Well, people are talking about you. You know, what's just happened in the neighbourhood mm. is, is just unheard of. Um, so I didn't want to leave the house. Um, being talked about was, was difficult. You'd, you know, you'd see people that you kind of knew in the street and if, if you were walking in their direction, you'd see them cross the road or turn around and walk the other way because they just don't know what to say to you. Um, but yeah, when, when things were in the papers, it, it, it was difficult because it's really hard not to read the comments at the bottom of an article, you know? Yeah, and some f- fuckers on those comments. You know, so, um, but it, it didn't get me down too much. Um, being in the papers, I just thought was a bit weird. Why is, why is it why is it interesting to anybody? Um, even when we got, me, and, me and Alex got engaged, that was in the newspaper, and I just thought it's, it's not really news. Um, it gives more people a chance to comment on, you mm-hmm. know, oh, he's moved on a bit quick and all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah, shouldn't <clears throat> be happy. Shouldn't be happy, yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, it was. It, it, I, I guess it was difficult. I mean, I, I, I don't think... Yeah, life life as a celebrity must be extremely tough. And you, you understand now why these people that, you know, on these reality shows like Love Island and things and they're suffering really badly with their their mental health is because, you know, they are... It, their world is social media and it can be a, an awful, awful place. You can get so much good out of social media, but at the same time, it can be really bad, especially for people that are vulnerable and fragile. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't imagine what it's like for them because for me it was a bit of... Uh, I just want to want it to go away now. I did the show. Mm-hmm. Um, really pleased I did the show. <clears throat> I just wanted to sort of like, get, I just, now I just want to get on and then my get life. back on yeah, your life. Yeah, like, yeah. Social media like as a poison, I believe that's why suicide is at its all time high because we're competing with other people everyone's life. Like we're seeing the good in all the photos and videos. <sighs> we're not seeing the struggles. No. Don't see the battles. I try and be honest as I can be when I do my videos and stuff like, not feeling good today, but. I need to soldier on, I need to, I'm in control, push myself through yeah. like Some people, when they're feeling like shit to stay in bed, but getting up and going to the gym for that hour instead of staying in your bed, you'll feel better. Staying in your bed will make you even more tired. Yeah. Like We're living in a world where people think, why do they get anxiety? But if they're drinking, taking drugs, eating bad foods on social media all day, watching crap TV, drinking coffee, smoking, fuck me, that I've just ringed off seven, eight different things there. <laughs> You're telling me that we're just caught up in this, yeah. this, this fake world sometimes where we forget our true purpose and what's really important. 
Like, yeah. I don't have the answers to it all. You don't have the answers, but we're trying. And there's are stages of your life when you're like, I'm the guy who laugh at a funeral. I'll go to a funeral and laugh. It's because I'm nervous. It's because I'm broken. That's because I'm sad. But when you go through sort of trauma and pain, like, you think to yourself, I don't have the right to be happy sometimes. And that's a negative that kicks in. That like, I shouldn't be happy because I've yeah. been through too much shit. So I can't laugh or I can't joke. But then there comes a time you think, the people who I've lost, their whole life would have been to see me happy, mm. to see me smile, to see me joke around what I always do. Because that can be the difficult thing of going through trauma. You don't think you deserve to be happy anymore. And that's right. the worst thing you can fucking think. Absolutely. I mean, I um, I remember feeling worried about what other people would think if they saw me happy. Like you say, I, I, maybe I shouldn't be happy. Um, certainly don't feel like I'm worthy of being happy for a long time. You know, for, for me, I was part of the reason why, why Nikki died. I wasn't there to protect my family. And it took me a long time to get through that guilt um i still feel partly responsible for it but you know it's not a massive part of part of me anymore um but yeah i, I say this to people a lot and some of the guys i help through through our um our charity we always talk about it's okay not to be okay but it's also okay to be okay <laughs> you know once you're on recovery um and you're getting you're positive and you're and you're getting on with your life <clears throat> it's all right to be happy you're allowed um don't beat yourself up about it, because I did. You know, I felt guilty about being happy again. Um, as you say, I didn't feel like I should be. After what I've been through, am I allowed to be happy again? Mm -hmm. um, but I put a lot of that down to the support I've received from my friends and my family. My mates are just the best mates on the planet. Um, I've grown up with most of them pretty much since junior school. We're a very uh, good bunch, a uh, tight bunch. And they just wrapped their arms around me from the start and they gave me the confidence to um, make decisions and um, not question anything and tell me I was doing a good job all the time. Even when I thought I'm, I'm, I'm failing, I'm, I'm sinking, I'm drowning, they were always telling me you're, you're doing amazing. What you are actually getting through day to day and, and what you're doing with the kids is simply amazing. So they kept giving me confidence and same with my family. And it was through that, I think, that I, I, I gained the confidence back in myself because that goes after you lose someone in that way. I was completely unconfident anymore. Um, it gradually came back and um, I then started to not worry what other people thought, strangers. So what if they think I shouldn't be happy? So what if they think I'm moving forward too quickly in my life? The only people I really care about, the ones I really care about, my friends and my family who have been here since day dot mm -hmm. and the ones that have cared for me, they all think I'm doing great. They're giving me the confidence to keep going. And so that's what I held on to. Um, I, I stopped worrying about the wider, the wider population. When actually, <laughs> most people are happy to see you move forward. Most people are, mm -hmm. you know, genuinely happy for you and, and want that for you. Sometimes that I think it's that paranoia creeping back in again. You yeah. just assume sometimes the worst yeah. of what people think. But do you know what? Most of the time, I found the, the best in human nature. Yeah. Guys that I never got on with previously in my town, you know, um, that would have run-ins with as a teenager and early mm -hmm. 20s, that kind of stuff, just other groups of, of mates that we didn't really get on with. They were messaging me straight away, like, you know, I can't believe what's happened to you. I'm so sorry for you. And, and now, you know, I talk to them all and it's, it's, I've seen the best of humans. I've seen the worst of mm -hmm. humans outside. I've seen the best. Yeah. Yeah, humans we're all we're, we're all right people man we're the right, majority yeah. is we're not like, bad are we yeah <laughs> like if catastrophes happen and bad things happen we kind of get together like mm. and we want to help like we're all right people like yeah. you're going to have your your badness out there that's that's also in life as well like yeah. good and bad everywhere like but human in general that like, you walk along the street you don't really see that that you've been through what you've been through is a very 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 small percentage but when you walk along the street you don't see People driving their cars are driving normal. You don't see people fighting and arguing. Like, no. the humans are we're all right people, man, and you can see the goodness in everybody. And for you to do that for what you've came through shows you your kind of character. Mm. But going for when was the last time you cried, Dan? You seem to hold a lot of emotion or do you do it in a, <laughs> a, 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 a room yourself? Yeah, I don't I don't I don't I haven't cried for a long time. Yeah. Um, I did cry a lot. Mm -hmm. Um no problem with that whatsoever. Uh I would I would cry in the shower. I would cry when I was driving my car. I would cry sometimes, you know, when the kids were in bed, I would get pictures out and all those kinds of things and, and have a good old cry. And it did make me feel better afterwards. You know, sometimes I'd be proper sobbing, you know, like, like I hadn't sobbed since I was a kid. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I cried a lot. I haven't cried for a while. Um, I still get the the the, the dread <coughs> come over me from time to time. As I said, when the the, the, the anniversary comes up, I could I can just feel it coming. That as you get out of August and sort of towards the towards September, middle of September, yeah, the dread is there, and you just can't stop it. <clears throat> no matter how much you feel like you're prepared for it every year, you're not. Um, so I, I don't really like to mark the day or anything like that. I just try and push through it. But crying, I haven't cried for a long time. I, I, I do get emotional from time to time, but no, not crying. Yeah, certain songs and smells and that. I used to see Robins and stuff, and I used to think, well, that's such and such, and I hear a song. That yeah, It's mad that... I cry a fucking lot now. I never used to because I always thought, be solid, man up, be yeah. strong. When really I was weak. Now I feel a bit more strong. I don't do it in front of everybody. Yeah. But certain songs <clears throat> will trigger it. Now, if, if I'm doing good, I kind of get emotional because you like, you know yourself that like, <clears throat> it's not just the anniversary you're losing the person. It's also birthdays, fucking Christmases or whatever that is. That like, it's just life, man. But. For what you've come through and, and sitting here and smiling and, and being as strong as you can be to show others that you can push through the pain is, is an inspiration. I genuinely mean oh, that, brother. You. But going forward for the future, Dan, what's the plans then? Plans are uh, to grow strong men to a point where it is recognised alongside some of the biggest charities out there. There's a real need for it. You know, um, men do need services specifically for themselves, the same way women do. Uh, and other groups that need services for themselves. Um, We talked about suicide. The the male suicide rate is obviously still going up. Mm -hmm. Um, Yet there's still loads, but there's loads of campaigns about now encouraging men to talk, encouraging men to do this, encouraging people to check in on their friends. But when we look at it, the only way I can see the reason it's still going up is, one of the reasons is the support services on the back of those campaigns are still the same old traditional support services that men shy away from. So let's put some meat on the bones behind these campaigns and, and put some proper services together that actually men will go towards rather than shy away from. And strong men needs to be one of them. Yeah. And I think um, I think going forward, next next three to five years, I'll I'll be disappointed if strong men's not right up there alongside some of the other big bereavement charities in the UK. Yeah, it will be. We will leave all the links in the description. But for anybody that's watching Dan, that's maybe going through their own bit of darkness and now and trauma, what advice would you have for them? If you haven't already told someone, tell someone. First, the first step to healing is admitting it to yourself and then admitting it to a friend or a doctor or somebody else that can help you. Um, don't keep it to yourself. It's not a strength. That's the weakness. Putting your hand up and saying you need support, knowing your limits, knowing when you need to get help, that's a strength and you'll get stronger from it. Yeah, I love that, brother. Would you like to finish up on anything else, Dan? Anything else you need to promote in or get out there um no i think i think that's it you know the charity is the main thing for me strong men it's all about that now um um the nine to five job will just tick along as it is and then one day maybe we'll uh, we'll be able to do strong men full time yeah next year that'll happen brother i can yeah. guarantee that that but for coming on today and telling your story and honestly brother it's an inspiration man it's great to meet Cheers, you mate. and um I look forward to see what you do for the future, but I'll make sure all the links in the description because I know a lot of people message me every day and struggle with that. I ain't a counsellor, I ain't a doctor. I can only talk from my own experiences, how I've changed. And I'm still learning as I go. I still make mistakes. I'm still human, brother. But for coming on today, you're a great man, great character. And I look forward to seeing what you do for the future, brother. God bless you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers, bro.